Uh, welcome to HKBU's research seminar series. Uh, today is our great, great pleasure um, to have uh, Dr. Wen Xu. So Dr. Wen Xu is Associate Professor in the Department of Communication of University of Massachusetts Amherst. And he is also a faculty associate of the university's data analytics and computational social science program. His research examines the vision, the trust, and dishonesty on digital platforms. His research often uses uh, computational methods to track the network diffusion and mobilization of ideas and people on digital platforms. Um, the topic of his talk today is studying digital traces of state affiliated media in a time of global pandemic and geopolitical decoupling. Uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Dr. Xu. Thank you, Dr. Song, for your kind invitation. And uh, I'm thrilled to join this space and to share um, some of the recent findings from my recent project. And uh, um, and, yeah, and as, as you just mentioned, that I, uh, I mainly use computational methods to uh, track political communications. And I, uh, chief, I'm chiefly interested in sort of how the online discourse has been shaped by, uh, you know, partisan uh, political groups and uh, and geopolitical interest. And um, so I've been conducting sort of two lines of research. One is looking at, you know, specifically in the US context, how this, in, you know, this insurgence of, of far right populist groups being, you know, uh, polluting online discourse, uh, forging communities online. Another factor, another line of research, which, 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 which is what I would focus on today is looking at, you know, online or digital platforms being this uh, space for narrative battles of or nation states motivated by geopolitical interest uh, to exert their soft powers. Uh, much of my talk today will focus on these uh, recent publications on uh, International Journal of Communication, which uh, uh, outlines uh, some of the methods that I that I have used to uh, document and, uh, and quantify the inferences and the practices of a state affiliated medium. And um, the, so this is the outline of the work. Uh, basically, we, uh, I wanna share two things. One is how, um, uh, you know, along with my co-author, how we develop this uh, framework to uh, look at multiple dimensions of the digital practices and inferences of state affiliated media uh, through a, a sort of global perspectives, not just looking at uh, state affiliated media in a few country, but uh, a, a, a look at uh, you know various countries across region types. And the second things I you know I wish to share is some of the caveats that that you know that I've learned uh, from applying these methods to. Uh, study uh, online text. Um, let, let me talk about the gaps of understanding uh, in this uh, in this realm. Um, so, the state media has it's one of the, perhaps one of the most well studied subject in communications. Um, but in the recent kind of literature, we have noticed that much of attention it has been paid to. Um, uh, problematic practices done by state affiliated accounts, not just state media, but state affiliated accounts uh, in the digital realm. And this includes, and digital platforms uh, actually have been, you know, pay attention or have been taking actions uh, 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 to address some of the issues such as information operations um, and major platforms in the West has, you know, started laboring uh, digital accounts that are owned, operated, by uh, state actors. Now, uh, an oversight in the literature is that too much focus is on state affiliated accounts or media as sort of the mouthpiece or uh, propaganda tools. Uh, much of the focus is on this uh, notable examples of you know trolls or uh, operation campaigns, but much of the attention is on how state media as a whole uh, it's, uh, it's an integral part of the global media ecosystem. And the state media, uh, we would look at, if we take a global perspective, they play different roles, you know, and they, they are operated by countries with 
a diverse set of a kind of a, I mean, political systems and, uh, and democratic norms. So in this paper, what I hope to argue is that we, if we wanted to understand the role of a state media in shaping the online discourse, we, we have to look at state media as a, uh, as a interdependent media ecosystem. And I, I will delve into what I mean by that in, in, uh, in, the, in the next few slides. Uh, the arguments for focusing on state media is that uh, it, it's a, a, a classical examples of a strategic communication because obviously those medians are uh, those media outlets are uh, have a, uh, some kind of strategies in mind and in many cases uh, state medians are arms of a respective country's uh, public diplomacy campaigns uh, to project uh, soft powers onto the world stage. To change to uh, change hearts and minds, uh, to build a nation's national images. Uh, second, uh, state media wear multiple hats. Um, oftentimes, we can, you know, view we view this uh, simplistically. Just view you know state media as uh, you know propagand pro product propagandist, but actually, state media sometimes play uh, have a, a competing roles to fill in. Uh, they they want to they strive to become a uh, you know legitimate uh, or a, an alternative media sources. Uh, they want to compete with uh, Lexi and mainstream medians. Uh, at the same time, they are diplomatic missions. Uh, they are the strategic communication outlets uh, owned by uh, a, a nation state. And third. Uh, they are inter inter interdependent as much as they wanted to become unique, uh, to put forward unique voices. Uh, they have to be, they have to play in an interdependent media ecosystem where they have to follow uh, media agendas uh, from uh, on other outlets. Um, they also need to rely on content produced by other outlets. And these three factors kind of shape my, uh, you know, the, the reason why we should look at state affiliate medians in the, uh, you know, on the, uh, in the, in the current digital communications. If we take a global per, uh, comparative perspectives, and uh, obviously uh, the categorization here, um, it, it's uh, it's it's sort of kind of, it's sort of like painting the complex uh, geopolitical reality with a broad stroke. But broadly, we can put countries and territories into three camps. Um, we start start with kind of these um, the two major two major world powers, Russia and China, being sort of the revisionist um, uh, regimes. And um, people can debate about what we mean by revisionist. So the so the reason I use this label because the the two countries have these geopolitical ambitions. Uh, seeking to um, revise or challenge, uh, challenge the existing world order. And more importantly, uh, is that, you know, the country's media policy has been uh, rooted in this kind of a long time uh, grievances against uh, the Western hegemony, uh, the sense that uh, the current global media ecosystem is being too Western centric, and they wanted to have their own voices being heard and they hope that the country will be well, more better or more balancedly, or, or, more, or, more, or more well covered uh, by the international press. So with that, uh, you know, deep sense of grievances. So the median, um, you know, in, in China, we all know that there's a, a median going out policy, which has been, uh, you know, focusing on building extensive uh, uh, international, a network, a network of international broadcasters. Um, uh, uh, across media platforms and across regions. And in Russia as well, where uh, if you look at the early government documents, it is uh, stated very clearly that uh, the goal is to avert the sort of these flows of negative information about Russia. So it has a very strategic goal, hoping to change or challenge the existing uh, media, a global media ecosystem. The second groups, uh, I call it a regional challenges. So the countries listing these camps, uh, these groups are, they are not the, 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 the world powers, but they are nevertheless um, major players in regional affairs. And they are oftentimes employed in, uh, employed in uh, regional uh, uh, geopolitical tensions. 
such as uh, you know the Shia Sunni divide, or countries like Turkey hoping to become a mediators in the region, uh, or uh, Venezuela, which is becoming this vanguard of the uh, Pan American uh, uh, left wing you know populist politics. So the countries in this in these categories, they 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 have their uh, state. A funded or state-controlled media, uh, representing the voices of each re respective country, and they are, you know, they are limited, to, you know, by the, you know, the inferences in their in their region. Um, so they are not the, you know, the most powerful actors on the in the global media ecosystem. But nevertheless, they have a very unique branding. They they they, they have a specific geopolitical interest, you know, uh, in mind, and they uh, they they also know where their uh, rivalries are. The third category, and this is where a lot of people find puzzling, is uh, we look at the state affiliated media in liberal democracy, and oftentimes we don't associate uh, liberal democracy with state media. So here. Um, uh, when we define state affiliated state affiliated medium um, very broadly, um, and I, I I feel it's important to point out that uh, almost exclusively the mediums in this in these categories they are uh, based on uh, they are adopting the public media mandate, so they are independently run. They have uh, independent editorial policies. They are public funded. With very little or no government uh, involvement, but nevertheless, um, they are still those media now still could be viewed as state affiliated because implicitly, implicitly those medians are a view as uh, you know respective countries, uh, part of a respective country soft powers. So we can think of um, you know uh, BBC as uh, yes, it's as it's uh, independent. It's a public medium, but it is, uh, you know, viewed as part of a, you know, the British legacies or the British soft powers. Uh, Euronews, which specifically, you know, it, it's it's funded with the mission to uh, uh, convey this pan-European perspective. So, although they are independently run, public funded, they have a an implicit aims of public diplomacy. So in, 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 you know, in that sense, uh, we still categorize them as sort of a state affiliated medium, but they can be categor categorically different from the other state controlled or state con funded medium in other categories. Um, in terms of how we kind of conceptualize the digital practices and inferences, uh, we can look at some um, the more obvious indicators like viralities, uh, popularity, just looking at how many likes and uh, the, all these a range, a whole range of in engagement indicators, which we can directly observe on, on the digital platforms. Uh, but I, I, I guess the, 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 the kind of innovation, the innovative part of this paper is uh, how we uh, look at three specific um, uh, practices, digital practices, that um, that are relevant to to the goal of state affiliate medium in the uh, in this kind of narrative battle, and I will go through uh, each of the three practices and uh, you know talk about how we uh, uh, propose the uh, how we kind of develop the propose the hypothesis or uh, research questions. Uh, the first one is pretty simple. You're basically looking at the content development. You know, looking at the volume of the content. Um, and this is um, sort of looking at, uh, we have, uh, you know, past research or reports that shows uh, how countries that have the, uh, that are most motivated geopolitically, uh, they invest a lot in expanding online audience, uh, investing a lot in expanding their digital, pres uh, digital presence of their state affiliated mediums. This even includes like acquiring, purchasing followers um, and uh, or just uh, uh, producing a large amount of content, uh, which could increase the chance that you know their content being uh, not noticed by by the online publics. Uh, the we expect that the the, the level of content development uh, could be 
uh, varied by the level of political interest. So, or the, the, the polit geopolitical uh, intensity. So in other words, uh, the outlets in the revisionist world power groups, you know, countries that are hoping to, uh, are the most, um, you know, pre pre uh, preemptive or aggressive in terms of promoting their geopolitical interest are expected to uh, to be more most active, more active in in creating content compared to organizations in in other groups. So that's about content development. The second one is the coordinated in authentic sharings. Um, there's a lot we can talk about. You know the motives behind. So the uh, coordinated in authentic sharings means that you have the content, and it's being automatically shared by a network, a close knit network of social media accounts. And usually this is attempting strategies for, for some content to gain variety, uh, to, to gain some attentions online. Um, and it can be a sign of uh, algorithmic malpractices, but I think the reality is far more complicated than, than that. We will, uh, so I will talk about uh, some of the results and you know, we can reflect on whether it is truly a, a algorithmic you know, malpractice or something else. But again, following the you know, sort of the same logic, is that the, uh, the countries that are most motivated uh, geopolitically, uh, countries that have the most uh, ambitious uh, geopolitical agenda, are are expected to be more active in using the coordinated uh, inauthentic sharings. And if you look at the past literature on uh, computational uh, propaganda, specifically looking at this uh, coordinated inauthentic sharing as a problematic behavior. We see that much more attention has been paid to uh, countries like Russia, which has been has launched a very extensive information operations. Or countries like Iran, which um, you know have been noticed quite a lot uh, by the digital platforms. Um, I I, I want to mention that uh, again uh, when when I see geopolitical intensity or geo, uh, geopolitical uh, ambitions, right? That's a very broadly defined. Um, that's not a precisely measure. So the only thing that, you know, because we have these three groups and we presume that countries in the revisionist world power uh, would have more higher level of geopolitical uh, uh, ambitions simply because of the nature of its, um, simply because its position in, in the, on, on the world stage, being a large economy, a large political powers, or having the swing to influence the, the you know the world politics. Uh, the third uh, practice that, uh, or it's actually tied to the digital influence as well. It's agenda setting and the following. And this is a kind of areas you know I think we we can talk a lot about whether the computational methods can be used or is appropriate to to measure uh, agenda setting or agenda following. So the basic idea is that. Um, the state media and they operate in the global media system. They, um, if you look at the brandings of a lot of state media, uh, for example, if you look at CGTN, which if you watch its promo, uh, the tagline is see the differences. So it, it sort of positions itself as this alternative media or, and if you look at uh, Russian Today, um, actually many other state affiliate media, you see that they, they brand themselves as, as this counter, uh, Western uh, counter mainstreams, alternative media sources. So they, they wanted to be different. They wanted to project or inject new agenda, new topics. Uh, but at the same time, because they are in this interdependent media ecosystem, uh, they wanted to build up their, they want to be viewed as a legitimate uh, international broadcasters. So that this kind of could have shaped two strategies. One is called blending, which means uh, the media could just follow popular news agenda covered by peer organizations, or they could stand out by becoming sort of a, a unique, alternative, uh, regionally focused, uh, uh, you know, media uh, media sources. And the past literature has actually doc well documented the you know differences in how the Chinese state media and Russian state media is being uh, covering world affairs. Uh, it is noted that the, the, the Russian state media tend to focus on 
rather not on the Russian uh, news, but rather on uh, news in in the Western democracy, kind of uh, trying to cover the controversies or divisions in uh, Western societies, whereas the Chinese state media pretty much tend to stick with the Chinese perspective or Chinese voices or promoting the Chinese culture. So very distinct sort of uh, um, uh, styles of coverage or topical choices that might be uh, captured computationally uh, using the method that we, we use in this paper. Um, so we propose two research questions to see if there are notable uh, differences in agenda setting and followings across these three different uh, geopolitical uh, geopolitical groups, um, and we have a sort of kind of a, you know a very descriptive analysis uh, conducted to address these research questions. Uh, the data sources uh, we did uh, we collect the three uh, we collect the Facebook. Um, uh, posts uh, 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 produced by um, by the selected state affiliated medians. Uh, you can see that there's this uh, a, a table that shows um, where medians are included. Uh, again, you notice that those medians are there's a, a wide varieties of uh, uh, media selected, and some are hundred percent state controlled. Uh, some are independently run. Um, uh, the, uh, the 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 list includes more like Russian or Chinese uh, media, uh, simply because that the two countries has the, the far more extensive media uh, ecosystem than other countries uh, listed uh, here, and the uh, we 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 collect the data through Crowd Tango and we select the time frame from uh, January first, twenty twenty, uh, to August 15, twenty twenty, um, that. Uh, that's the time frame that we, you know, that covers some major developments. This includes the pandemic, uh, and uh, you know, the control measures taken to uh, in response to the pandemic, and then the uh, the, the the diplomatic, uh, you know, rows between China and the U.S. Um, so all these uh, important uh, events of uh, import of geopolitical influence uh, of geopolitical importance is. Uh, should be covered. Should be uh, covered during, by this time frame. Uh, next, I want to talk about the measures. So, um, and uh, we 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 tried a different uh, computational me measures. Um, and so, for the digital inferences, those are straightforward. They, well, those we can get. Uh, they, these can be just measured by the engagement indicators that we got from uh, 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 digital platforms. Although. Uh, we don't know uh, how much, you know whether those uh, in engagement indicators are to be trusted because of the presence of you know purchased likes or, or shares uh, you know you have with inauthentic sharing. So sometimes those the popularities could be inflated, uh, but without uh, further evidence or uh, data sources, there's nothing we can approve. But we're just going to rely on uh, what is made available. Uh, through uh, the crowd tangle. Uh, for the inauthentic coordinated sharing, uh, we use the uh, this R package uh, called CoreNet, uh, developed by um, uh, uh, colleagues in, in Italy. And we look at the four indicators. Uh, these four indicators are gave us some broad ideas about the kind of size or the types of coordination networks that are involved. Um, so the this uh, package would look at the the data about the, the sharing basically connects to uh, the 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 crowd tangle API and look at the here sharing histories of a particular post and look at how to what extent the sharing takes place uh the sharing of that post took took place within a short time frame uh, namely 16 seconds Right, so the sharing that takes place within one minute, and then it looks at the accounts that are involved in this near simultaneous sharings and look at the connections among those accounts. And chances are those could be some close knit networks or clusters of accounts that are doing the bidding for a particular that are automatically sharing uh, the posts uh, from a uh, from a, a news outlet. 
Uh, agenda setting, agenda following, that's measured by uh, uh, package, the R package, R news flow, with some manual validation. And this is something uh, I know we'll talk about later about the uh, caveats that you know we have learned. The R news flow is this package that compares the um, the content similarities across uh, uh, different documents. Um, and using this 24 hour sliding window. So it's gonna compare the similarity, let's say between two countries, similarity in text in between two countries or two outlets, uh, uh, you know, and then creates a network of uh, information flows. Later, when I present the results, you will see how the agenda of setting and flow, uh, following is being mapped out by, by this package. So some results, um, I wanna start with just the, you know, the most uh, straightforward indicators of digital inferences. And if we track the average likes, um, it, you, know, it, you know, if we look at both the, by the three different geopolitical groups or we buy, buy, buy specific, by different media outlets, uh, we see that in terms of the average likes, daily likes uh, in the time frame that we selected, uh, it is noted that the, the the Chinese state media and the Russian, uh, well, the Chinese state media in particular, has uh, have outperformed some other Western media outlets. Um, and if at the aggregated level, if, you know, you notice that the revisionist world powers, namely the Russian and Chinese state medians, have uh, outperformed uh, media outlets in other in other geopolitical uh, categories. And this is about the daily likes. Uh, but things becomes, uh, you know, a little more, more complicated if we look at uh, average daily shares. And it seems to be more event driven, right? It doesn't seem to be a clear patterns that one, you know, set of outlets would outperform others, or one type of uh, countries uh, would be, uh, you know, better at attracting uh, shares. So it could be just daily uh, driven by specific events. Um, people share certain type of post more simply because they are living through different stages of the pandemics. They are, uh, you know, involving different, uh, they are interested in different types of, of world affairs. In terms of content development, uh, now this is when we notice that, again, the if you look at the top outlets in terms of the number of posts per day, uh, the 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 Chinese state medium uh, the, that are pretty much uh, are the most active uh, kind of a cluster of media that are in terms of producing content uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, posting uh, content on Facebook and uh, so so the the, the general before we, so before we look at the, the next part of the results we 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 seem to uh, you know if you look at the post, the post volumes, or in or looking at sort of the, you know the digital inferences, you notice that the the Chinese state media is actually quite notable. There are notable examples here because they, they you know they, they are uh, outperforms in terms of the daily likes that they receive, uh, and they are more active than uh, other media outlets uh, in uh, in terms of producing content, but obviously. No, those are very, very, very rudimentary, very rough indicators. Uh, so uh, we can, you know, uh, you know, reflect on this finding and see, you know, is there, a, you know, a reason behind the more active posting? Yeah, uh, and, and I think that that's up to uh, further discussion. But at least the numbers here seem to indicate that that there's uh, seem to be a pretty active and uh, in, uh, content, uh, Chinese state media seem to be a pretty active content contributors. When we look at the inauthentic coordinated sharing, I think this is the part where uh, there might be some surprising results is that the, if you look at the literatures um, that focus on this behavior called inauthentic sharings, uh, almost exclusively, almost exclusively that the, the attention is paid to uh, media outlets or state media controlled by, uh, you know, uh, countries that seem to have the most, uh, the most aggressive or um, uh, the most uh, geopolitical ambitions. Uh, 
But here we notice that um, uh, on this page, it would note that this uh, the first graph shows the entity account. That is basically the number of uh, uh, Facebook accounts, uh, Facebook public accounts that are uh, that are sharing a content uh, for a particular media outlets, or for or for media outlets in a particular uh, geopolitical groups. And here we see that the the liberal democracy group uh, uh, it, that are seem to have the largest numbers of of Facebook accounts that are involved in in authentic um, coordinated sharing. Or put it simply, or put it simply, basically the, the, the liberal democracy uh, groups have the most uh, uh, Facebook bots uh, 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 promoting their content, right? So we could ask you know, whether these are done by on purpose or it's motivated by some other reasons. Um, this can be surprising to, because the list, the list that we, we, we use in, in, in the list of media outlets they, we we have far more Chinese and Russian outlets on the list than the, the outlets uh, in other in uh, in other uh, uh, geopolitical uh, groups. Uh, the graph on the right side uh, that's the component accounts. Um, this is uh, if we look at um, the the kind of a coordination networks uh, promoting content for a news outlet. Uh, this network would be what it contains different components or subgroups or clusters. So this numbers refers to that, the number of clusters. Uh, it's another way of looking at the type of networks uh, that exist uh, uh, that promotes uh, the, the state median's account in authentic, in, 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 you know, through, through bots or through automated ways. And here we see that uh, the revisionist word powers, uh, you know, have the highest component account. Uh, just by the, those numbers, and this is the, one of the caveat is that if we look at those numbers, there's, uh, you know, we can suspect, you know, what, what, what contributes to this, but um, we will not know more until we actually look at what types of content or what kind of accounts are involved in, uh, in authentic coordinated sharings. Um, this is the graph. Uh, this is the table that shows the um, uh, the the outlets, the outlet level. If we look at which outlets seem to have the largest shares of accounts uh, in proportion to the number of uh, posts they put out there. So I'm, uh, you know, just in the interest of time, uh, I, I would just say that uh, the uh, is you know it seemed like the. the the, the pattern is not that clear. You no, know, we do see that you know a few Chinese state medians uh, top the list, but then you have uh, have you know a CNN's or uh, Iran's press TV uh, on the on on the top. I think the most interesting part um, does not necessarily come from those net network metrics because if we look at the network metrics uh, from the 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 package. Um, we, we have some ideas and we have some kind of a, a, a general general observations, but we also did a post hoc analysis. We're looking at what kind of accounts are uh, involved in uh, sharing the state of affiliated medians uh, posting. Um, and this is the one we noticed that there are significant differences uh, between uh, you know, the, uh, uh, different, different countries. And here, just using a few examples. For example, the the if we look at the kind of the, the uh, uh, Facebook accounts that are uh, uh, sharing Chinese state media's content in a coordinated ways, those accounts, uh, the accounts in the network, or I should say that the coordination networks for the Chinese state medians is comparatively small, uh, and they are homegrown. So what I mean by homegrown is that. Once you have, um, you know, CGTM uh, post something, it's gonna be picked up and shared almost instantly by uh, Xinhua News or China Plus or People's Daily or China Daily. Um, it's homegrown because basically it's gonna be picked up by a network of other Chinese state media. And you do have some accounts in other countries, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Ethiopian, 
Um, but I don't want to read too much tea leaves here. You know, yes, the you know we might argue that those are countries that tend to have a friendly tie with China. Maybe there's some kind of geopolitical alliances. But I think the over the, the one notable pattern is that the Chinese coronation network is actually quite small compared to um, the mediums in other countries. Now the Russian network is it's, it's much more extensive, and it has a very clear very clear political leaning. Um, you know, in the in the coordination networks, you would find uh, Facebook accounts. Uh, so when I say Facebook accounts, I mean Facebook pages or, or group public groups. Uh, they are tied to uh, far right politics, uh, tied to pro Trump movements. Uh, they are they are they are not just in the kind of uh, U.S. or Europe. They are actually in a lot of uh, countries in the global south. Uh, they seem to tap into this far right or populist uh, 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 resentment uh, against the West or against the established party establishment in, in the West. Uh, this is not surprising because if we look at the past uh, US election, we noticed that the, the Chinese, uh, the, the Russian state media actually being a, 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 a vocal uh, media source uh, for the 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 far the populist the populist the far right. Um, now the regional challenges not works. Now here we you know if you recall that the uh, countries that are in, listed in this in these categories are you know Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela. So they are uh, many of them are in the Middle Eastern region. Um, so they, they they the kind of networks they uh, the the kind of accounts that are sharing um, the posting from. This uh, uh, geopolitical categories, they are mostly left leaning. So they are associated with uh, causes like a free Palestine, uh, they focus on human rights, right? So they are distinctly different from the type of accounts in the Russian uh, network, in, in, the, in the coordination networks for the Russian state media. Uh, if we look at the, the, the liberal democracy groups are looking at you know, media outlets like uh, Euronews or DW or French 24, um, then they are coordination networks. They are political in nature, uh, but they are their political affiliations seem uh, far more diverse than the what we see in the Russian network, which is uh, predominantly right leaning. Again, those are very kind of uh, preliminary observations. We did not, you know, quantify this. Uh, uh, this composition of the network in any way would basically look at the top uh, uh, actors, and we just call them, and we 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 create. Uh, we, we this is our uh, observations. So I think the you know this preliminary preliminary uh, uh, observation help us con to contextualize the numbers we get uh, from the computational methods. Uh, lastly. Uh, agenda setting and the flowing. So the, uh, so just kind of a, uh, I want to explain those numbers here. Um, the this not in this network graph, it shows it has the error from uh, flowing from one country to another. Um, the not the numbers represent the proportion of a content in in the in one uh, in the mistake media in one country overlaps or are similar. Uh, to the earlier uh, published content uh, in the state meeting in other countries. So, for example, the if we look at the graph on the uh, on the left side, when we have the the numbers uh, of point twenty two sixteen six from German to uh, from Germany to China, that means twenty close to twenty three percent of the content uh, in the Chinese state meeting are uh, similar in terms of topic are similar to the content that first appeared on DW, right? Because only one country, only one news outlet selected for Germany. So, um, and the graph on the right side um, takes a complementary metrics. Uh, it looks at, uh, so if I number, let's look at the, the point Two three sixteen eight uh, from China to Germany. That means the twenty three percent of the content in the in 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 DW overlaps in terms of topics 
overlaps to uh, it overlaps to the earlier published co uh, news content on the state media in China. So, in this way, we we are able to see uh, which countries dominates uh, the the flows of uh, of information or, or a news agenda, and you will notice the centrality of China here. Uh, the Chinese state media seem to be. Uh, on the receiving end, and also on 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 the on the uh, as a source uh, in terms of uh, in, in this in this network, both the source and the target in this network. Um, this could reflect the fact that um, in this sample, we uh, we have more Chinese outlets represented in this sample, or it could mean that something unique about the the type of strategies that Chinese state media might have adopted. Um, so I categorize that as a blending and speak out. So basically it's both, uh, the country's state media are both agenda setters and agenda followers. So it's following the media, it's following all the other news uh, topics that are covered by peer organizations, you know, in, in, the, in, in, in Europe, in the US, but also the kind of topics that are on CGTN or People's Data, they are also you know, picked up, or at least you know, in terms of broader topic, they also mentioned or covered by media sources elsewhere. So, it shows you know pretty much that the, uh, in particular, if we at the country level, the Chinese state media are pretty interdependent uh, in this in this global flows of news agenda. Um, some discussions that I, I think that we uh, we can look at those. Um, uh, in, in, in a way that we can uh, look at how what, what can we learn about the digital inferences uh, and uh, practices of the state affiliate media. Again, because this is a, a global um, uh, kind of, we take a global perspectives. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the literature has primarily focused on a few countries, right? When we talk about state media, uh, either on China or on Russia, uh, sometimes about uh, Qatar's uh, Al Jazeera or Iran's Press TV. But here, if we look at the digital inferences and practice inferences, uh, we see that um, the the two kind, the China and the Russian state media, they 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 seem to be quite active or aggressive in terms of content productions. Um, but in terms of the actual inferences, uh, we have a much mixed evidence, uh, especially when it comes to sharing. So the sharing in terms of you know, creating, uh, attracting you know, uh, this uh, viral online attentions, uh, we don't see a clear pattern that these aggressive content productions are corresponding are associated with you know, better engagement outcomes, except with the exceptions of the likes, although we can also suspect that to what extent those likes are, you know, reflecting the true popularity of the content. Um, the second point is this interdependent in the news flow. I just uh, actually just mentioned in the previous slides about um, the fact that uh, the Chinese state medians are at the very center of this flow network, uh, news flow network, and being the uh, both the agenda setters and uh, the uh, agenda followers. Uh, so it, it shows that, and uh, even the previous literature says something about the Chinese state media uh, pretty much focus on, you know, telling Chinese, telling, uh, telling Chinese stories or focusing exclusively on the regional uh, country specific perspective. But here we see that it's, it, it's, it's strive to become uh, this, uh, you know, a, a truly global media in a sense that it's following agendas covered by other outlets, but also having their own uh, agendas covered by, by um, you know, by, by the other peer organizations. The last point is sort of unfinished, but I think it could potentially lead to something really interesting is the ideological alliances of the, in, in the coordination sharing network. Um, we noticed that how the Russian state medians has been, uh, the, the kind of coordination networks 
have this pro or a right leaning uh, 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 right leaning uh, includes a lot of right leaning uh, political uh, accounts, whereas uh, accounts in uh, uh, state affiliate media in the regional challengers groups have this left leanings, and the uh, there are two things that we uh, want to you know discuss. One is that uh, part of this is not surprising uh, in a, a separate projects that I'm conducting, looking at uh, the coordination networks for the uh, state dip uh, diplomats or for the uh, uh, country's uh, foreign minister's uh, Twitter accounts. We noticed, uh, so I noticed something very similar. If you look at the kind of coordination networks that are promoting, uh, you know, let's see Chinese ministers of foreign affairs uh, messages, you notice that um, many accounts are based or tied to countries like Pakistan or Sri Lanka. Uh, and in a way that reflects this, uh, uh, you know, important international relations or a good uh, diplomatic strategic relations between China and Pakistan. Um, and you will notice that countries that uh, that are promoting the uh, Chinese state, uh, Chinese uh, diplomatic diplomatic messages are also located in, uh, you know, Belt uh, Belt and Road. In, in uh, regions where uh, those countries have a friendly tie with China. And then if you look at the Russian networks, uh, the networks that are promoting the Russian diplomatic messages, you, you see that, yes, it's very similar to what we see here in this paper, is that it has this uh, kind of anti-Western uh, point of view. It is uh, pro, uh, it is uh, pro this far right. Uh, and um, so, I, I guess the ideological alliance is something that we could be investigated further. But more importantly, uh, the what does this ideological alliances mean? Does it mean that the state of media medians are, purpose, uh, are, are strategically using coordinated sharings to increase their, their, their outreach? Um, I suspect that that might not be the case. Uh, because you know, on the one hand, this is a, a sort of a very tempting strategies, but it's also possible that um, these medians are selected uh, by uh, different political groups online uh, for their own political agenda. So, uh, suppose a a a, a kind of a, a, a counter Western. Uh, uh, political uh, 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 public Facebook uh, Facebook pay, uh, groups uh, when it wants to promote its own uh, geopolitical narratives uh, it could include it could set uh, you know it could automatically re retweet what comes out of a Russian today uh, Sputnik simply because that's the news source that fits their uh, that fits their uh, narratives that fits their geopolitical narratives um, and whereas for a lot of human rights oriented, uh, especially for those that focus on the human rights violations in the Middle East, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East regions, they could set up uh, new spots that automatically uh, pro, uh, uh, sharing uh, articles from Al Jazeera. So I, I think the point is that we, 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 we don't have the data uh, to show whether the these coordinated sharings, it's actually a practice or strategy taken by the news outlets, or is something that the news outlets are passively involved in or being picked by different political groups online to be there to endorse their political uh, 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 narratives. So uh, just some observations. And then next, uh, I think the last point is just kind of caveats. Um, we noticed that, so it's something that I just mentioned that we don't know about the motive behind uh, this frequent, uh, large, quant uh, this uh, frequent uh, active content productions. We can suspect that it has something to do with, uh, you know, uh, the interest in expanding digital uh, presence. Uh, we don't know if there are strategic considerations behind the topical choices. Uh, we can suspect that, yes, the mediums, they wanted to, uh, they, they wanted to carve out their uh, you know, brand images or their unique voices. So they got to do something about the choice of a topic. And uh, uh, you know, likewise, we don't know about the we don't know the motive behind the coordinated sharing. It could be 
some strategic tool used by state media, or it, it could be that the you know the state media being being used by other political groups uh, to amplify their political agenda. Um, equally important, I want to mention just that the the caveats that we have learned is that um, the when we were using the R news flow for uh, measuring agenda flows. And we did a manual validation of field that's, that's very important step. Uh, we are able to uh, conclude pretty confident, confidently that the news, uh, our news flow has been uh, quite effective in, in detecting uh, a broader, the similarity in the broader topics, right? So for example, if the median, uh, our, if the media organization A covers um, the lockdown measures in, in Wuhan and the other is talking about something similar, that's going to be captured. Uh, uh, and but however, what it what it not what it's not able to capture uh, is the the very nuanced uh, coverage when it comes to uh, framings. Uh, that is something that uh, m you know my team has been uh, is working on uh, trying to develop new tools. And to make to add additional filters uh, filters to this tool, uh, or to uh, look at more nuanced coverage differences. Because in you know if we look at this, if we think about the the variations uh, in in state of feeling the medium, uh, much of the differences it's not lies not in what topics are covered, what news events are, are covered, uh, because the you know we can pretty much expect that if there's a breaking news somewhere it's going to be picked up by all the media ag news agencies around the world whether you know regardless of the nature and regardless of the type of medium but the, the the real differences in narratives lies in selective uh, you know, framings uh, strategic framings now that is not uh, i you know I, we, we, no, I don't think that the r news flow is it's it's built for that uh, for for these uh, to to detect these nuanced uh, selective uh, strategic framings, so just some caveats, uh, but also room for future development of the two. And I uh, we uh, you know I look forward to the conversation where we have about you know the, the you know the the, the context of uh, state media uh, shaping the narratives, but also the computational methods applied to study state media. So that's my uh, that's my thoughts for now. And uh, again, thanks for. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to happy to answer the questions that you have. Thank you, Wayne. So uh, you can uh, open uh, your audio and speak directly, or you can type yeah. on your questions in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Xu, may I ask a question? Sure. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Xu. So uh, my question is that. Uh, uh, you just talk about the algorithm perspective and you said that uh, you give the example of the lockdown and you said the lockdown is a more broader uh, topic, if I understand correctly. And mm -hmm. you said that uh, some nuanced frames need to be uh, identified to for the, for the study. And uh, may I ask that uh, do you mean that this nuance of frame is uh, uh, like subtopics of the lockdown or how the different media uh, discuss these concepts? Mm, like mm, uh, mm. what's their perspective in discuss yeah. the lockdown, yeah. all the subtopics? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. This is a great question. I, I, I think I meant both, right? So it could be the subtopics when you look at the lockdowns uh, you know, yes, the the, the, the the general topics of lockdown might be covered using this method, but um, you could focus on the different subtopics, whether it's about the uh, economic impacts of the lockdown or the uh, or daily lives being disrupted by the lockdown or the effectiveness of the lockdown, right? So we can view that as, um, uh, as subtopics or uh, that also, you know, reflects how uh, how differently media, uh, news media cover the same event. Um, so the nuanced uh, aspects really lies in not just about uh, what events are covered, but how the events are covered. But that is harder to be captured. 
much harder to be captured using the, the this algorithm. Thank you, Wayne. Here, so we also have a question from Bai Qi in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So the how do you define an operationalizing authentic sharing? So um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this. Uh, so in authentic inauthentic coordinated sharings has been um, uh, a pretty well documented phenomenon, and uh, I think the current more contemporary terms is uh, coordinated inauthentic behaviors. Right. So it's defined by. Um, uh, actually by a very distinct patterns in online traffic, which is when you have the content and it's being, well, two things. One is that it's being automatically shared almost instantly. So if you post something, it's going to be picked up, automatically shared. Then it pretty much indicates that the, 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 the it's not the real people that are sharing the content. It could be the bots, right? It's uh, There's some kind of automation. And the second uh, thing to consider is that whether or not it is being uh, um, automated, automatically shared by a, a closed network of accounts. Uh, so one time we observe, uh, and the, 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 the R package uh, it is able to detect that uh, looking at whether there is a, a, a specific groups of accounts that are similar, simultaneously promoting the content from uh, specific sources. So I get there are, there are two things. It's called, um, it, it, you know, it's it, it's um, it's called inauthentic. inauthentic. Um, the um, so I, I in this in this study, and I trying to um, so I'm trying to address your second question, which is uh, whether this study first obtained some inauthentic data sources and then focus on behavior. So uh, we so we basically look at uh, with the package we have. Uh, and the access with the crowd tango. Uh, crowd tango actually provides that data, provides the sharing behavioral patterns. So the package is able to look at the sharing history, uh, the entire uh, body of sharing history of a particular account, uh, a particular post, and 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 then looks at you know whether the sharing is it's it's almost immediate or simultaneous, or whether it's done. And, and whether it's done by a, a subset of accounts that are, you know, uh, uh, that are uh, sharing the content at the same time, uh, I don't know if I explained explained uh, clearly. But inauthentic basically means it's not done by, uh, it's not organic, right? But 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 the the um, but I want to clarify, uh, you know, by saying that the it's oftentimes inauthentic coordinated sharings carry this. Uh, negative connotations. It means that, okay, so you have, uh, there's something malicious going on. Oftentimes there is, but oftentimes they are just, they could be just new spots. They could be just new spots. People set up new spots to promote, to, to um, you, know, uh, you know, gather followers uh, and, and, and just to get their voices out. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's inauthentic, but not necessarily malicious. Thank you, Wayne, for the clarification. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Xi, for uh, sharing this very interesting topic. And for the third part of the results, uh, you examine agenda flows across countries. That is a kind of retransmission of outlet, outlet A by outlet B after its release. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm wondering, how did you define the degree of similarity between the news mm -hmm. reports of the two mm -hmm. media? Did you set yeah. any threshold, say, uh, ninety percent similarity or totally uh, same, to determine the similarity between the two mm. news stories? Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, yeah, so I, I can uh, delve into the uh, the technical specific uh, the specifics. Uh, so uh, several things. One is that uh, uh, so first of all, the numbers, the the default setting. Uh, in the, the in the algorithm is fourteen percent similar, right? Uh, so we 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 do not expect uh, the news tags to be nineteen percent similar because that's basically plagiarism. So our news flow works very much like the plagiarism detection software, looks at the uh, similarity. And for news articles to be fourteen uh, percent similar, 
that means something. And we actually did a manual uh, validation. We look at uh, the news articles that are deemed similar at the 14% uh, level. And we look at whether or not they are truly covering the same topics. And the chances are they are. They are talking about uh, you know, very similar topics. And second, we are not just looking at the similarity in the entire um, or in, or in all kinds of linguistic elements. We are looking at the similarities in nouns and hashtags. Um, and because the most of the news agenda are in terms of similarity, in terms of similar topics, are reflected by um, those entities, right? Um, so we did a few tweaking. Um, and we actually followed the developers of the package, you know, in, in, in their original piece, they have, they, they focused on the norms and, and um, we added a hashtag because given that this is a face, uh, Facebook post, um, sometimes New Eden would use a hashtag. Um, so what else? I think we also look at, um, yeah, obviously we removed all the filter um, stop words and other words that are redundant. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the parameters that we, we, we entered in, in, uh, in applying that method. Thank you. Dr. Song, if I have, may I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Th thank yeah. you, Professor, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, but I have a couple of questions, which is, uh, I am curious to know why, uh, say, a country like India, you could not put it in revisionist or mm. liberal democracy or regional challenges, is there in the report, because it is the world's largest newspaper market with over 70,000 newspapers and over 500 satellite channels. I don't see that country in the, mm. the research study. So I'm curious to know, is there any specific reason for that? Mm. Number mm. two is, I was looking, it was very interesting when you got those network map comparing. So uh, you told in your presentation that you picked up one channel from Germany and probably the result could have been different had there been more. Was there any rationale behind selecting a few from a few country and more so from other countries. Thank you. Yeah. So the the, the question is about whether the about the sample choices, and um, I agree that the sample is not exhaustive. I mean, this sample left out very important regional players, like countries like India, which would fit. You know, if we are going to include India in in the list, it. Uh, you no, know, I would argue I would put it in the groups of regional challengers, uh, for two reasons. One is that. As you said, it's not a, though it's deemed as the largest democracy uh, by Western society, but it's going through this democratic backsliding. So we can pretty much argue that, you know, there are, uh, you know, distinct features of Indian politics that does, that, that put, that, you know, defines very differently from other uh, classical uh, liberal democracy. And the second reason is that, um, it has very, you know, it, it, it's it, it has a it, it it's involved in this kind of a, um, uh, regional rivalries, right, between uh, Pakistan's, uh, between India and Pakistan. So it, it would have fit the the profile of regional challenges being a, a, a you know a water power. But you're right because the, the, you know even uh, you know India has a, a large media market. And, um, and, you know, if we look at the size of media, it's probably uh, uh, outweighed many others on, on the list. Um, so there's no particular reason why Indians, well, actually there is. Um, probably reason is that we, we're trying to find a, a, a outlet that, that we can call it's Indians state affiliated uh, media. Right. Um, I guess we could argue that the All Indian Radio is one of the uh, state affiliate media because this is the media that kind of seeks to, uh, 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 you know, uh, present Indian point of view. Uh, we do not consider others commercially run, commercially run uh, mediums because they are they are targeting sort of more the domestic audience. Um, but but we did not include All, all Indian Radio because. Um, if you compare our India radio, if I understand correctly, it have a far less kind of audience size compared to outlets like Al Jazeera or TRT World or or press or even Press TV. It is far less notable 
on the in in uh, as a state media. Not to say that India has a uh, you know India has a huge media market, but that in terms of a state affiliated media or a media outlets that 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 we view as the ambassador of of, of Indian voices on the world stage. I think we we, we struggle to find appropriate examples, but maybe maybe we are wrong. Um, we also left out a few um, uh, uh, media outlets that, that should be included, like uh, the uh, the Channel News Asia in, in Singapore, which uh, kind of fits the um, you know the, the typical definitions of uh, type of media that seeks to you know apply certain regional perspectives to pro project country soft powers. Um, but then, uh, yes, you know, it's not uh, sort of, it's not commonly analyzed that as an example of, uh, you know, as the as a kind of a media outlets that carries countries' public diplomatic missions. Um, but I guess I I want to just conclude by saying that it's not, um, you know, the the list is not uh, definitely uh, leaves out a few very important countries and and, and media organizations. Thank you so and much. And we, yeah. So in the in the comments that the um, in in the comment session about NHK, so uh, we include NHK uh, mainly because the uh, in the past the literature on public diplomacy, the NHK is often is often mentioned, um, and it's 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 in the peripheral in the network. It's in, and it's not uh, surprising at all because. Um, no, it's not sort of the median that seeks to be, um, uh, you know, specifically about it, like Japanese perspective. It, 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 you know, it's 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 a sort of median that um, uh, it, it, it's like a, a you know typical uh, you know public uh, public broadcasters. Um, so, and it could be that it's it's at the peripheral. Could it be that it's not uh, it's not covering a lot of newses. Uh, topics is not covering a lot of topics that are popular among others. So it maybe because of the specific content or programmings, uh, or or it could be just the the, the sheer uh, volume of content out there. Uh, that 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 you know you notice that the China Chinese state media is at the center. Part of the reason is that you know we have far more Chinese outlets selected, and by having more outlets selected, you you increase the chance that. You have different topics being covered by this vast, uh, vast network of, of state media. Whereas for countries like Germany, I, have, I only have one, um, uh, or uh, for Japan, that's only one uh, international broadcasters represented on the sample. Thank you. So, any questions from the audience? All right, Professor Song, can I ask a quick one? The last one. Sorry to go ahead, Anilash. Yeah, your time, uh, Dr. Wayne. Thank you very much for sharing your work. It's really interesting. Uh, I come from a non-positivist background, so I would <laughs> I would assume that you know where this is going, right? Mm -hmm. so for me, statistics and numbers and networks uh, really do not explain beyond a point when it comes to uh, role of media and politics. Uh, so I wanted to understand how do you determine that the agenda is set mm -hmm. in a research like this, and also. Are we over exaggerating the role of shares and lives? That is to say, what does it mean that, okay, three countries or four countries, you know, okay, peddle a certain kind of content and it has been shared by millions? Does it necessarily mean that the agenda is set in a classical sense? Mm. So, how do you determine what likes and share mean mm. uh, in this age where, you know, there's a massive flow of content on social media platforms? Does it tell anything about the role of politics, the role of geopolitics, the intent of the media at all? I mean, to what extent do we rely only on shares and likes and similarity mm -hmm. of content? Mm -hmm. I, I like, yeah. yeah, thank you for your question. I like uh, this line of question because um, it really kind of pushed the envelope in our thinking. So uh, I will start with the second part of the question about, um, uh, you know, just uh, are we, why are we you know, kind of uh, obsessed? Are we too obsessed with, uh, you know, these engagement indicators? Um, and I, I tend to agree with you that just having a more likes and shares doesn't mean much things, especially uh, considering that those likes and shares can be purchased. But I would still argue that for uh, in, in the strategic communication point of view, uh, 
for the sake of the broadcast, international broadcasters, I think it's important to track because uh, we can assume that, especially for revisionist world powers, those countries that are hoping to expand their digital influences, specifically expanding digital influences or presence, it's part of their public diplomacy. Uh, I think this shares and likes becomes uh, the KPI uh, in how the these media inferences and uh, public diplomacy campaign, uh, how effective those are, right? So perhaps internally, internally, that's the number that will be discussed um, uh, by the you know the managers by 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 the by the newsroom in a way that shapes uh, if they are if they are strategically thinking about what contact will drive the audience. Uh, perhaps that's a number that will shape their practice to some degree, but we don't know unless we do the interview. Uh, but looking at the bigger picture, yeah, it's 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 questionable. It's questionable how. Uh, what the reach, the, the the audience reach, or the more whether the more visibility means anything consequential. And actually, if we look at the data shares, the patterns seem very random. Um, you know, you know, we we actually look at the content that 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 are most shared at at each peak, and sometimes it could be. Um, I remember, one of the the peak was contributed. Um, no, I, I may, you know, but it, I, we mentioned it in the paper, but it could be driven, driven by a, a very specific event. Um, uh, it could be natural disasters or the uh, the uh, the killings of then Ira Iranian um, command by the U.S. Uh, Air Force by the U.S. drones, right? Now, just because that piece was shared far more than others, doesn't mean that. It's, it's an endorsement of that median's uh, content. It's really just driven by the events. There's a far more interest in public interest in that. And it happened to be that's the news that's covered by that organization. So it, yeah, I think your questioning of the value of the uh, the, the shares and likes, it's, 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 it's valid, right? And the second, um, you know, the, the questions about agenda setting and agenda following, um uh, yes these are um these are hard concept to measure quantitatively right um i think we are just scratching the surface we're looking just looking at the at the 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 most general um, broad level the what events are what topics are covered what events are covered um does not mean that um I guess the we cannot say definitively that you know just because the organization the media organization first break the news it means setting the agenda. I, I think that the 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 true agenda setting is far more complicated than that. But here, agenda setting of followings are used as uh, very broadly, you know, not as a precise empirical uh, uh, construct, but as a very broadly to show. Um, at the aggregated level, uh, what topics, uh, the, you know, the similarities, the similarities in terms of topics on news agenda over time. Now here, obviously, I'm conflating, I'm conflating the term topics with agenda, right? So agenda, we could argue that uh, it has a specific motive behind, like, you know, you know, the organizations wants to introduce a new topic. Uh, it could be different from topic, uh, from news topic per se. But but here again, those are very general labels that we put here, uh, put here to to help kind of audience uh, to un to understand what we're talking about. But also kind of connects to um, connects to um, the the pre the past literature, the past literature on on the online inferences. But much is said about online gatekeeping or so gender settings, and we are using these uh, uh, packages that are developed. Uh, you know, it was used in early study, in other studies the, to, to map uh, gatekeeping or agenda setting. So we're kind of following that traditions of using computational methods to, you know, look at, you know, the flows of inferences. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, not a question, but just a small comment. I think yeah. inadvertently the academia is falling prey 
to the real agenda setting of these tech platforms. Because mm-hmm. whether we want it or not, we have been emphasizing the role of likes and shares. And you know, it comes across in many uh, you know, articles published recent, recently where they say, okay, we analyzed million tweets, we analyzed half a million tweets, and it was shared multiple times, and mm-hmm. they are confused, da, da, da. And I think that, okay, are we promoting Twitter and Facebook here? <laughs> like, <laughs> why do we care about how many people are promoting it? But, well, but thank you very yeah. much for clarifying that. But, but I would, I would, I think this is, a, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you, but I, I want to also challenge by saying that the, um, you know, in many cases, you do see that likes and shares being translated into something consequential, right? So, so you know, not, not to see that we should view that as the sore indicators of inferences, or that, uh, or we we use that as a as as a sore me- proxy measures of digital inferences. I think, but but you know, once you have a content become uh, shared a million times, uh, that that still means something, right? Yeah, yeah, but but uh, on the uh, philosophical level, I agree with you, and uh, and thanks for the comment. Thank you. So there is a question uh, in the chat box. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from the reviewer pro- point of view, um, detection, uh, community detection, there are there are, uh, descriptives. Yeah, I, I yes. Uh, um, so the question is about um, studies being descriptive, and but the a lot of journals are looking for uh, causal associations, um, statistical hypothesis, like hypothesis testings. Uh, that's a fascinating question. Um, I, I think the um, I have. Um, I have some unfinished thoughts on that with regard to that questions. Yes, we had that challenge when we were trying to publish um, that piece because it's exploratory, it's descriptive, um, it does not test any theory. Uh, it basically describes what's there. And that I think in the recent in recent years, you might be able to publish a few because the, of the topics, right? Because the phenomena you are describing, uh, even if you use just descriptive natural measures, right? Um, but down the road, people might become more, uh, you know, much more judicious when it comes to uh, purely descriptive um, findings. Um, about the causal associations, um, I think the the I think one uh, areas that that could you know potentially that we could see the combinations of um, networks and um, um, some kind of a statistical um, uh, testing is uh, the notion of the network ecologies, where if we view this media ecosystem as a, you know, as an ecosystem, as a self-involving uh, organizations uh, that are, have uh, external constraints and internal dynamics, there are some patterns to follow. So we, we might be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, test whether some of the patterns that we see in the network, in social network formations, just, uh, you know, dissolutions, Will you know will be viewed will be reflected in um, in in this um, in the in this context, um, but but also um, but also I, I want to say that so much of what we study here, um, especially when we look at um, you know state media uh, discourse online, or you know in my current research looking at how fringe political groups are using space, a digital space for you know, carving out uh, to expand their, their powers. Uh, they don't usually follow a particular patterns. Uh, you know, there's a much uh, unknown unknown. Um, we, we may not have a good theory or established patterns to test. Uh, maybe the old theory may not apply in a very unique settings. So that's why I think sometimes we might be able to we might struggle to find a, a good a good theory to test in this in the case in this case. So so a lot often time we just um, kind of enjoy the part where we we see what's out there, what's who you know we 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 document what's there. But definitely, as you as as you said in in the in the chat, it's yeah, it's uh, there's there's sometimes it's it's the the journal expect. That you would have hypotheses, you you have the deductive reasonings, or you know inferential statistics in the paper, and sometimes network analysis only gives you the descriptive findings. 
So if uh, no more questions, um, thanks again to Wayne for this really fascinating talk. Uh, and I think today it inspired uh, great conversations. So we are looking forward to more. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, again, thanks for, for the opportunity. Thank you. So thank yeah. you for